I'm in my third year of study. I'm studying at the Facultad Salvador Allende in Havana, which is the same province of Havana, but in the city. I did my two years of med um, basic medical science here at Elan in Baracoa, but now I'm in Havana. How was your Spanish when you arrived? It wasn't at all. <laughs> um, I could read Spanish. I could write Spanish on a I'd say high school, or I took Spanish in college, but I definitely could not converse in Spanish. I couldn't hold conversations with people. Uh, I heard um, Reverend Lucius Walker speaking on NPR about the program, and I had been looking into medical programs in the United States, being open to studying anywhere. And the catchphrase was free medical school in Cuba. and. After I looked into it, I looked it up on the internet. I spoke with um, Reverend Walker, and that basically decided it for me. I handed in my application. I received word from the Cuban Ministry of Salud, and I got in, and I was ready to go by August. I graduated in May, and I was here in August. Intimidating or what? <laughs> it's because the there there's not that much information about Cuba in the United States. Um, you have to readily, readily look for that information, so I just didn't know what to expect. And then there's learning medicine in Spanish, and that's the other factor that kind of makes you think about it twice, because not only do you have to learn all of this terminology and these different diseases, but I have to learn it in Spanish, be able to defend myself in Spanish, be able to answer questions, take exams, and just live in another country that, where the language is not something that I speak firsthand. And right now, I'm studying in the hospital. I have to be there every day at 8. And I have patients that come and they ask me questions and I have to speak to them and I feel comfortable doing that. I feel comfortable in the knowledge that I have and being able to express to them what's happening with their, with the patient or with like their loved one or anything like that. So. There's a lot of prejudices about Cuba and in the English-speaking world, I guess. De there definitely is, and it's sometimes it's covert, sometimes it's overt, and um, it takes being here to break all of those stereotypes and to really open your eyes and see all the things that this culture and this society has to offer people. Because you can look anywhere in the world, in South America, in Africa, in Europe, and find Cuban doctors or Cubans, Cubans studying in other places, that they're not confined to this island, and that's what's said in the United States, and that's not the truth here. So just being here opens your eyes to a lot of things that you're told and not told in the United States, I would say. In terms of the technology, it's here. There are, um, there are CAT scans here. There are radiology machines here. There are institutes. There, there are a lot of things here that you wouldn't think. You guys get an internet um, turn on twice a month? Twice a week. They get to use the internet twice a week. Yeah. So they rotate throughout here, they rotate throughout the American delegation, they get to use it twice a week. For us it's different since we have to be in the hospital and the hospital is separate from the school. So the hospital, you do what you have to do there, then you go to the school and do what you do there. But we have access also and if not, there are always um, places that you can go and purchase an hour of internet and it's fairly reasonable, reasonably priced. So the access is there. What, the, the prices at the tourist hotels are very expensive. What's the price like in, in local money? Oh, well, you pay in dollars. Sometimes you can pay at $1 for an hour, $3 for an hour, $6 for an hour. It depends on where you are. There's actually a biblioteca in on 23 that it's free to use the Internet. You just have to sign up for it, and you can come and use it. So the access is there. You just have to be looking for it. I mean, in New York, you can get a, medical, a scholarship to go to medical school, but it's very hard to come by. It's very hard to come by. And if you want to pay your way in, what sort of money we're looking at? Well, for the state schools, you're looking anywhere between $300,000 tuition, four years, and then you have to add on to that your room, your boarding, you're paying for, you're paying for the board exam. That's going to bring you anywhere between $400,000 to $500,000 that you've accrued in debt. I imagine you have a look at the issues of 
translating your qualifications into the US? Yeah, for, we're, in a, we're in a good situation because this school is accredited by the EFCMG, by the World Health Organization, meaning that when we graduate with a title here, if we go to the United States and pass our board examinations, there are three sets that we have to pass. If we pass those, then we will be licensed to practice in the United States with this degree. We don't have to go and, and enter into another medical school and revalidate our title. With this um, certificate that we've graduated, plus the boards, if we pass the, and we enter into the match, we can be practicing physicians. The students in California are having a little bit of a problem because the a lot of the hospitals there want to know more about the school, more about what we're learning to see if it is on the same plane. So that's the problem that they're having now. But besides that, we're in a good place because we really don't have to worry about this title not meaning anything. Uh, well, I heard, like Keisha, um, I heard um, a, a news bit on NPR, National Public Radio. And so I, I went on the website and contacted um, Pastors for Peace, got an application, sent it in and applied, and so here I am. Yeah, Washington, you know, is a very kind of conservative town. Um, people sort of tend to themselves a little bit at times. Uh, you come here and the Cubans are very open, they're very fiery, they're very, they talk very fast. So even though my, my background is Colombian and I did have a good base of Spanish, uh, the Cubans just, they re speak really quickly. So it's just kind of like even that itself was kind of difficult at first. Um, a lot of the medical terminology is rather similar because we do try and study uh, in English and Spanish at the same time so that we can be prepared to be able to converse and, and be able to uh, look at a board exam and understand what's going on. So a lot of the terms are similar. Uh, so the the end goal of the program is, is we do have a lot of uh, parts of the country uh, back in the U.S. that are underserved. There aren't a lot of, there isn't a lot of medical help. Um, even just getting, uh, just trying to get into a regular hospital. A lot of people in the U.S. use the emergency departments, say, for as their primary care doctors. And uh, these emergency departments are being overflowed, mainly geared for us to, to go back and serve in these underserved populations and, and give that uh, attention to these people that do need it most. And I think that's everybody's end goal is to, to work with minorities, to work with people who don't have direct access to, to health care. Mm. Um, we have an inner semester break. Um, but it, it's encouraged for us to, to stay here. We do have courses in between semesters, but at the end of the year, say mid-July, we do get to go home, and uh, up until about early September is when we have to come back, and it's usually very nice to go home, <laughs> see our families, because you, know, you spend a year away from, from family, loved ones, friends. And yeah. we, do, we do need a license. We, uh, it, takes a process, it takes a while for, for, for us to get onto that license, uh, but um, usually by, by the end of your first year, you have your license um, in writing. In writing, it's printed up, and you have it in your hands, and you can travel then after that, so you're good. In our dorms, we live with eight other people, and if you're not really used to sharing such uh, small spaces with a lot of people, it can, it can get kind of nerve-wracking or a little... So, I mean, even if you are used to spending uh, time with uh, lots of people in small spaces, you still need some time alone and you go off and find a little quiet, solitary space somewhere like off by the beaches. Mm -hmm. um, we are next to the beach, so that's, I spend lots of time there sometimes, just meditating, thinking, <laughs> studying sometimes. You go home, you get bombarded by just commercials and buy this and upgrade to this next cell phone. Like for example, when I, w when I got home, um, I went out with some friends and my friend was like, oh my gosh, look at the guy next to you. Do you see what he has? And I'm like, no, what is that? It looks like a phone. He's like, no, it's not just a phone. It's the iPhone. And I was like, what's the iPhone? <laughs> so, um, you know, and I have some friends who just upgrade like every other month with technology. And you come back here and it's just like, you don't feel that push, that drive to, to buy this and get, get this latest gadget. So... Maybe that's a relief. <laughs> it is a relief. It, it is a relief. I'm in 